We love basketball here on Off the Podium, and we are so excited to be able to speak to another athlete from basketball, a three-time Olympian, London 2012, Rio 2016, Tokyo in 2020, and an esteemed career, which I'm so excited to learn a little bit more about today. Please welcome to Off the Podium, the one, the only, Kim Gaucher. Kim, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me. It's so exciting to talk about basketball. We haven't done it enough on this show, and I feel like we, we need to catch up uh, so much over all the years that we've been on air. But I always love finding out how people take, uh, I guess as a child, playing a lot of basketball, going into then competing in three Olympics, because it is one of those sports that I feel everybody has a bit of a go at at some point when they're, they're a kid. Um, what was it sort of about basketball to you that kind of went from maybe playing it as a kid a little bit to eventually captaining your side in Olympic games? Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I started when I was quite young, um, just like the annoying little sister following my older sister around. Uh, <laughs> and then she ended up getting quite serious about it. And so, yeah, I always really looked up to her. I always loved the game. Um, remember fondly a lot of backyard basketball being played outside with my dad and my older sister. And then when I was in high school, actually, it was in grade nine, uh, my basketball coach uh, let us skip school for the day and drove us into Vancouver, where I got to watch the senior women's national team practice. And wow. I come from kind of a small hometown. And there was actually a girl from my hometown on the team. And it was the first time in my life that I had been exposed to like real professional women um, that played basketball for a living. And I was like, boom, like mind blown. Um, that's the coolest job ever. How do I do this? Uh, and they were gracious enough to, to talk to us, to give us some advice and some tidbits. And so I left that practice being like, this is what I want to do with my life. Um, yeah, obviously it was like, back in the day before YouTube and all of that. Um, and so, yeah, having that exposure, being able to see that was, was huge for me. Cause I was going to ask in terms of that time frame, how was basketball in Canada in terms of just exposure to certain things like that? Because if I, my calculations are correct, sort of when you would have started playing, this was pre Raptors and Grizzlies in the NBA. So uh, obviously I didn't know if there was maybe a, a national league for men or for women at all. Uh, obviously the Olympics probably would have been a lot of exposure, but sort of was basketball kind of a, a big deal growing up in Canada in a pre NBA uh, and other sort of exposure level world for the country? Um, you know, not really. Um, I mean, I did grow up with the Vancouver Grizzlies. They were, when I was in high school, we had them, um, they left around the same time that that I went off to university is when they got traded. Um, but I mean, it was, it was hard to see basketball, you know, it was rarely on TV and we still in Canada are one of the only countries in the world that does not have a women's basketball league. Wow. Uh, so for us, it's still, you know, it's, it's still a battle. It's always going to be a battle um, to kind of get that, to get that exposure out to young female ballers to be like, Hey, look, this is what you can be. This is what you can do. Um, nowadays it's a lot easier with social media. And obviously we have, you know, players playing in the WNBA, which is close ish. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to be a professional basketball player, as a Canadian, it's sort of like your, your career starts and you have to pack up your bags and move somewhere around the world. That's crazy to think that there's not a women's league because it was a similar thing, wasn't it, with um, soccer after Tokyo once the women won the gold mm -hmm. that I don't think there was a women's league uh, at that time either. So it's, it's kind of crazy to think that you've got such great players that are going out there doing such great things. But as you're saying, you kind of maybe just have to go south of the border to kind of try it there or across to Europe or maybe to Australia or, or somewhere to really kind of pursue that mm -hmm. dream. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. Uh, on one hand, it's like you get all of these amazing experiences. You know, I've been able to travel the world and play a sport, which is pretty cool to be able to experience all of these cultures. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, it's kind of like you play basketball 12 years, 12 months out of the year, sorry. And so you're spending eight, nine months of your life every year living, living away from family and friends. So you miss a lot of weddings. You miss a lot of... You know, when my nephews were born, I was never really around um, f to be with my family during those times. Um, not something that I would ever 
give up um, given what I've given what I've done and what I've had the chance to do. But you know, if we had a league in Canada, that would be incredible. Um, and yeah. I think it would help grow the game so much. Uh, I know that there's hopefully a push to get a WNBA team at some point in time, but uh, you know, hopefully the, there's some, there's some people thinking bigger and hopefully at one point there's, there's a league. I, I would have just assumed with what happened with the Raptors a few years ago and how much that would have had exposure that, you know, that was just a given that give the WNBA team to Toronto or something along those lines too, to see how that all played out. I'm surprised that hasn't already happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's people that want it to happen. And so hopefully it does. And hopefully it doesn't stop there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, growing up sort of outside of basketball, were you very athletic, sporty, typical kid playing a, a whole bunch of different sports at the same time? Yeah. A whole bunch of different sports. Uh, I was super awkward and shy as a youngster. And so my parents were like, okay, you must be in team sports because you need to make friends. <laughs> And so, yeah, starting from a young age, it was like soccer, softball, um, cross country, I guess, was the individual sport that I did. Uh, basketball, volleyball, kind of played a whole bunch of different things. Um, yeah, had a lot of fun, but basketball was, was always my favorite um, and kind of the one that I always gravitated towards. I love that you could do a lot of stuff just outside on your own or just with one friend it wasn't like you needed a whole crew to to get something going to practice in terms of sort of all those sports that you're mentioning uh the majority of them sound like they're all olympic sports so was this sort of uh, a a goal that you sort of looked at watched the olympics as a kid and thought hey like this would be something to strive towards honestly it was really that first exposure when i was in grade nine so it wasn't even like when i was growing up that i watched the olympics and was like oh man i want to be you know, in the Olympics, it was that I didn't even realize that was a thing that I could do or be until I saw, you know, people doing it um, mm. live and in person. And so once I saw that, then I was like, get me to the Olympics. Um, but obviously, Canada went to the 2000 Olympics in Sydney. I joined the national team in 2001. I was a I was a little high schooler. I wasn't one of the 12 best players in the country, but they were like, hey, um, you know, we see a future in you, so let's bring you on board. And then we did not qualify for 2004 in Athens or 2008 in Beijing. Um, and so, yeah, it's the Olympics are really hard to get to. And mm. it had kind of been my obsession for, for, you know, those early years on my national team. And there was a big group of us that it kind of became that. Uh, that obsession and how do we get there? How do we get Canada back on this world stage? Which I can imagine because Canada had been at a couple of Olympics in a row and then obviously to miss a couple of Olympics in a row. So, and as you're saying, qualifying for Olympics, not exactly easy. And is it, I can imagine too, being in the Americas region as well, obviously you've got the US there, but it's probably a pretty stacked area puerto rico as well are kind of in there mexico you know obviously it's a pretty uh difficult area to qualify through so it, it, i can imagine it just makes you work harder towards that goal of going towards an olympics those two times that you do miss out before you get to london yeah when i first started with the national team um, brazil and cuba were and the us obviously they were three teams that were ranked top five in the world um Obviously, the FIBA Americas has changed a lot. Uh, they've also switched up Olympic qualifications. And so now it's not just you start in your zone and then it's kind of everybody from all over the world is sort of mashed together for that final qualification, which would have really helped us out in those earlier years. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's all right, uh, because we've got, we're back on the world stage now, um, dominating the, the zone there in the FIBA Americas and it's really good to see. Which I guess when it comes to other tournaments, so world championships, you have uh, Pan Ams, which we'll obviously talk about as well. Um, Commonwealth Games seems very sporadic. It's like, hey, we'll have you this year, but then we'll get rid of you the next one. It just, they never seem yeah. to make their mind up when it comes to those. So yeah. it's, I can imagine it's, and it's, is it really a sport like in, on women's basketball, potentially in the 2000s, where you would be doing like, say, like a friendly? Like, would you, you know, constantly be having Canada's going to play England or Canada's going to play France? Like, you know, you sort of have what they do, say, in, in a lot of soccer. Was this a common thing to have a friendly match or a friendly series? So we used to have 
uh, really long training camps. And then there was a long stretch there where, because we didn't have a lot of money as a federation that um, China would pay uh, for us to come and play them. So we spent a lot of summers going to China uh, and playing in China and that kind of being some of our only games outside of the America's tournament. So wow. we uh, rarely got a chance to play on Canadian soil in those early years, which is, you know, goes back to that same thing, the growth in the game now. It's, it's one of the things that Canada basketball really tries to do is to get, to get the women and the men playing at home so that, you know, our country can see us. Because if not, it's really just when we're at the Olympics um, that people kind of, kind of pay attention. Um, and hopefully now at the World Cup this summer, people will be watching and paying attention to the women's team. But yeah, it's always been a battle to to get people to see us, to, to get those opportunities to play friendly. So I would say in those early years, um, yeah, just Canada's far from a lot of other countries. And so it's tough to get people to fly over just to play Canada. So a lot of it was us flying to them. Which is always fascinating to me when you learn that basketball was technically invented in Canada. So it's kind of, uh, you, you know, why isn't this a, a thing that this should be almost your, your national sport? Because there's always that fun trivia thing I like saying to people. It's like, you know, national sport of Canada, clearly they're going to say hockey. But then you go, well, there's a summer one as well. And people, oh, basketball? No, lacrosse. Like it's kind of one yeah. of these sort of things when it's that way, which it is, it's just... I lived in Canada for a bit and it, it really was a case of basketball wasn't what I thought it would be. And also particularly so close to the US where it is such a big sport. So it's always fascinated me that this isn't a sport that Canadians, until at least now, have really embraced as much as they probably could. Yeah. Um, you know, and it goes back to what I said before. It's just one of those sports that's, I mean, hockey is crazy expensive. Uh, mm. You know, basketball is one of those sports where, you can play in your backyard. And I think um, 3x3, I think we have very talented 3x3 teams. And I think that's going to really help basketball as well take off kind of all across the country. Um, I think that's one of the things when you have such a large country that, you know, I mean, there's really only 12 players that play on a national team. Um, but to have that 3x3, I think that's going to help grow it across all of our provinces and territories. And I'm really excited to see how that how that unfolds you went to university in utah uh had a bit of an okay there uh time there kim i mean you ended up being the first female athlete to ever have your jersey retired ended up leaving there as the uh the highest scorer in utah history i mean what was that experience like to sort of go from a, a country and sort of a, a growing up in a we're talking about basketball maybe not completely prevalent to going to a university which has uh, got a great basketball program and uh, you end up leaving basically as the greatest female basketball player of all time at the university. I had a lot of fun in university. Um, I had an amazing coach who, you know, is still one of my huge mentors in my life today. And I actually got to team up with a fellow Canadian, um, nice. Shona Thorburn. Yeah, which was pretty cool. Uh, and... Yeah, I mean, university, it's just such a different experience in the U.S., you know, it's, um, it's giant, nice facilities and stadiums. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you go to school and you play basketball on the side. It's a pretty sweet getup. Uh, <laughs> I had had a blast for four years. I would, it's always one of those things where you're like, man, I will go back and do university again for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And if my maths are correct, so were you there sort of just – on or after the Olympics in 2002? Were you, so, were you there just for after. the... Just after, no, right. Okay. Just after, yeah. Which is so I was saying to my, you... Sorry, my university dorm was the Olympic Village. Wow. The freshman year where I lived, yeah. So that okay. was... Okay. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Not long afterwards. Because yeah. yeah, I was saying to you off air that when I went to Salt Lake, you know, I went there to check out the stadium because it's, it's baffling to somebody from Australia that you have a, an Olympic opening ceremony basically at a university stadium. Like you would never do that mm -hmm. in Australia. But obviously the sizes of stadiums in the US are a little bit different. But was, I mean, was there a vibe sort of like a couple of months after an Olympics that it was still a bit, you know, exciting, particularly at the university where you're sleeping basically in probably the bed that you had a skier or a hockey player or something mm -hmm. in it beforehand? Yeah, I mean, I think the infrastructure and stuff at all greatly improved because of the Olympics, you know, uh, and so you had the public transit and obviously you have the signs and the Olympic rings everywhere. Um, 
that, you know, kind of stay up as legacy projects, which for me, I always loved because that was always my motivation, you know, was to get to the Olympics. And so to be able to see that and cross it almost daily in your training environments was pretty cool. In terms of that honor of having your jersey retired, I mean, as I said, the first female athlete in the history of the university to have that jersey retired. I mean, what, what does that mean when they give you that phone call or that email? Like, how you going, Kim? Just, just letting you know this is going to be happening. Come along. And then I can imagine seeing it hung up on the rafters there, retired. I mean, that, that must be an insane honor to have. Yeah, it was, it was really pretty unbelievable. Um, I, I remember my head coach called me and she's like, all right, when can you come out? Like, we're doing this. Uh, this is huge. Um, you know, I mean, to be the first female is, is pretty incredible because there's, there's a long list of really successful players. Um, and yeah, then, you know, when, when we went there, I was kind of like, I looked up in the rafters to see if I could like see it the night that they were doing it. And I didn't see anything. And I was like, Oh, like maybe they'll just do it later. You know, like it's no big deal. <laughs> but then it was like that actual like unveiling thing where they ripped it down. Um, and it was just kind of like, Whoa. Uh, and even now today, when you go back into the stadium, you always sort of glance up there and you're like, oh, that's kind of crazy. Like, <laughs> that's me. That's me. That's you. Yeah. Does, it, does it get yeah. you free entry then forever in the stadium? Free like popcorn and stuff? You just literally point it to the ceiling and go, me, that's me. Give me, give it all to me for free. Yeah, I've never tried that. I've never oh, tried that. Now you can. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I know. I should. That's totally something that my husband would be, would be like, let's try this. And that's totally something where I would would be so mortified and embarrassed. Oh, I think I think you're entitled to. I think that kind of if they had that. There. What is what is your jersey number? And and was this something that you sort of came up as a kid and you stuck with throughout throughout your career? Yeah, so I was number four uh, in university, um, and number eight with the national team. With the national team, they just sort of gave you a number, and I was like, all right, I'm number eight. You know, I never really <laughs> chose. It was kind of like I'm on the national team. This is really cool. Um, in university, I was number four. Um, yeah, not a, not a real. Was that it was just sort of really given to you and you stuck with it or you, yeah, you sort of chose like, oh, like, all that'll do. Number, and I was like, okay. Number four, you know, like I was never, I was never a big number person. So yeah. But is it exciting though? Um, when, when we had Mariana Toll on a few weeks back and we sort of asked this question to her about how, when, if you're looking in the crowd and you, you see a young girl wearing number four, if you're at, U, at Utah or a number eight, if you're there with the national, I mean, that must be a pretty special feeling to see somebody wearing your jersey in the crowd. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's really cool to think uh, that you have the chance to impact young young female ballers, you know, the way that, that I was so impacted um, by some role models when I was younger and how that totally shifted um, and defined – kind of my my path and my career goals uh, and so to see that when you're when you're playing I mean I think it's one of the huge huge reasons why we play um, and you know something that you want to be able to pass it on you want to be able to share that passion um, and so to see it it's really cool. I've got to ask one question before we move on to uh, 2012 because I'm excited to hear this story but around about that time you would have been at the University of Utah a certain Australian by the name of Andrew Bogut would have been there around that time too. Do you, mm -hmm. do you cross circles much with Bogues and sort of do you have any experience or stories with Bogues at all? Um, not like, I remember we picked him up. So his freshman year um, was, yeah, we, um, my teammate and I were driving and we saw him just like walking around campus because he didn't have a car. Um, so we popped over to pick him up. Uh, he didn't talk a whole lot that, that <laughs> freshman year. Um, I remember him always being um, insanely talented and just kind of this, this big giant dude that would, that would roll around campus without a car. Um, <laughs> but, wow. yeah, no, he was always really nice. And then we've actually been able to cross paths a few times at the, at the Olympics. Um, Great. Kind of snap a picture really quick. Nice. Well, I can tell you now, he's definitely made up for those quiet years. He's very vocal when it yes. comes to a lot of things yes. these days. So uh, definitely took uh -huh. took a bit to kind of get that yeah. way, but he's there now. <laughs> so there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, lo I love kind of this story when you eventually qualify in 2012 for London. Now, this was on Canada Day, I believe, in Turkey. You had to play Japan uh, to get into the Olympics in 2012. Take, take us through that because, I mean, it seems like the stars align that you're doing this match on Canada Day of all days to help qualify for Canada's yeah. first Olympics in 12 years. 
Yeah. Well, so the way that tournament worked is you played uh, like two games and then you played a crossover game with a team from another pool. And if you won this crossover game, it's like you were good, you were going to the Olympics. Um, and so we played that crossover game and we lost and it was like oh my goodness there's now like one spot left and there's four teams left in the tournament everybody else has gone home um so you're in this giant hotel uh all the other teams like partied that night and it's hmm. kind of like you're left with the four teams and one one shot so in the i guess we'll call it the semifinals, we played argentina who the summer before had knocked us out of the direct qualification tournament in our zone um and so it was kind of like we just smacked them like right from the start and it was like this all right uh, and it yeah it set up the game on canada day in turkey uh, like the canadian ambassador in turkey was at the game um wow. we had yeah yeah we had a few family and friends that were at that game and it was the greatest moment of my basketball career uh i think that i i would ever have i think even if i had ever got the chance to step on a podium, um, which was always my goal. I think that that memory would always trump it because that was just years of hard work and just so much stress uh, and relief and joy, like kind of all mixed into, into one. Um, the celebration that night was probably the most epic that you could have. Uh, <laughs> nobody really slept. We, we had a really long flight from, from Turkey back to Canada the next day. Uh, and it was just kind of like, whew, we did it, you know? Um, to go from not qualifying in 04 and 08 to finally doing it was incredible. On the last chance, last game on our country's birthday. You're there, wow. How, how is a Canadian women's basketball party after you call, like, I mean, you know, like I, I don't, I, probably what happens in that party stays in that party. You won't be able to share with us today, but I mean, you know, is it, is it kind of like if you're ranking where you've had parties at, you know, university in the WNBA, like at the Canadian women's national team qualifying for the Olympics, that's at number one, basically. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because, you know, a lot of times at these events or, you know, in university, it's like, there's other people around, but because we were the only team left, um, obviously Japan wasn't really into partying. Um, and so it was really just like us. Um, and so, yeah, we had, I mean, the Canadian ambassador at the time came to the hotel, you know, it was like all these wow. people, you know, the, the family and friends that had come um, joined us. And yeah, it was kind of like they bought some pizza and there was some drinks and it was the a rest very is good history. time. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. So, sorry, right, Japan, yeah. Japan. You know, within ten years, they got an Olympic silver medal, right? So they were fine. That, that was okay. Yeah, you know, they, they can, did quite they, all right. Yeah. They can miss they that one. They did quite all right. Yeah. So we don't, you know, feel sorry for them then. But now they're they're completely yeah. fine. But from that moment on, then you qualify. But obviously, in a lot of team sports, just because you help qualify a team, you're not automatically selected for the team. So, do you sort of have a moment there where you know you're playing all right so you're pretty confident you're going to be selected but i can imagine is there a period from that qualification to when they announce the team that maybe a bit's going through like okay well this has got to happen i'm surely on this team i've been on the team now for 10 years this is going to be something that i'm going to be doing um yeah i mean well that was kind of one of the craziest things with that last chance qualification tournament is that it was really just like two, three weeks before the Olympics started. Wow. Uh, you know? Yeah. So it was kind of like my family had actually already booked tickets to London and they were like, all right, Kim, like you better. And if not, it's a family vacation. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I'm joining that family vacation, you know, at the Olympics <laughs> if I'm not, if I'm not playing in them. But yeah, so it really wasn't a whole lot of time. I think we had like, two, three days off. And then we had training camp for maybe a couple of days and we flew to London. So it really wasn't like. You're there already. You know it basically. Yeah, like, you yeah, don't have much like, of a choice. <laughs> yeah. There wasn't ever any alternates that were brought in. It was kind of like, these are our 12. Wow. Because we, we get that so much from our winter guests is that qualifying usually can happen weeks before a games and summers generally, it's obviously a lot uh, <laughs> further away, but that's insane to think that. And particularly for a team sport where, you know, sort of not knowing. I mean, you've obviously got great chemistry and camaraderie having just come off that momentum going into an Olympics. But I mean, there's a bit more preparation, I can imagine, for a team sport and getting everything ready versus a, a sprinter or a swimmer or somebody like that who's yeah. predominantly individual. 
yeah, I imagine the logistics behind it all um, are a whole lot for both, you know, a Canadian Olympic Committee and also Canada basketball. Um, but thankfully, as an athlete, you just get to live in like the bliss of <laughs> go from point A to point B and not worry about anything else. Um, that's all kind of taken okay. care of, which is nice. Yeah, I was going to say that Team Canada are there going like a couple of weeks. All right, we booked all our flights. We're good. Oh, crap, we've got to book another like 30 flights and find another 30 beds. Like, shit, come on, guys, quick, hurry up, find those beds for them. <laughs> they can do it. They can do it. Yeah. Which, do you have a moment that you kind of clicks that you're an Olympian at that point, Kim? Like, is it is it getting the uniform? Is it is it arriving in London? If you do the opening ceremony, first game on court, like, is there a moment where it kind of all hits you? It was running out to the first game on the court. Um, I remember we played at like 11 a.m. for our first game, which is really early as a basketball player. Like it's not one of those sports where 11 a.m. is a normal game time. Um, but yeah, it was it was running out for that first game, and it was like seeing the rings all over the gym. Um, it was it was incredible. It was like the culmination of hard work, and you were like, "All right, now let's just have some fun." Yeah, we're well, just going to ask that. Was there a goal kind of going through uh, the tournament that now that we're here, anything can happen? Uh, do you set yourself a you know a, a medal target, quarterfinals? Like, kind of what was the target of the team going into London? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was it was to see what we could do. You know, we always felt like we were we weren't that far off, um, and unfortunately, we wound up playing the U.S. in the quarterfinals. Um, that first game, we played Russia, and they were. They were one of the top teams, and we ended up uh, leading almost the entire game and just kind of losing it in the last in the last minute there, which was pretty rough because that would have really set us up for a, a desirable quarterfinal matchup. But, I mean, when I look back at London, it was kind of just like – was really disappointed at the end, you know, when it was over and we lost to the U.S., but you also – we're kind of like, we, we did it, you know, it wasn't, whereas in Rio and in Tokyo, um, when it was over, it was kind of like, man, we screwed up, you know, like mm. this is devastating. The Olympics are over and we didn't achieve our goal. London was like, oh, I'm sad the Olympics are over, but man, I'm an Olympian. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, very different mindsets. You beat Britain. I mean, I can imagine that the atmosphere on a court up against a home crowd is, uh, you know, you're not in the home crowd, of course, at that point. You're the enemy. Yeah. But, I mean, still the atmosphere, I can imagine, because the Brits definitely know how to cheer on their sporting teams. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, I mean, those are the times, types of games that, like, you live for. Those are what you love when you get to play in a giant packed house. Um, obviously, it's cool if they're cheering for you, but... <laughs> Uh, even if they're not, you know, to be able to play in those types of games and those types of environments are, are, are what all athletes dream of, I think. I think you had three very unique Olympics too because, you know, obviously learning from a lot of our Tokyo guests who maybe have only been to one very unique and weird Olympics. And then mm -hmm. I know through a lot of athletes who have, say, been to Rio and Tokyo, they were kind of told in Rio that this is going to be a weird Olympics. This might not be quite a normal Olympics. Look forward to the next ones. But then, of course, you've kind of experienced all three. You have London, which is, you know, a great games, a lot of uh, crowd involvement, effort, you know, thoroughly well-run games. Rio was a very interesting game with some issues, but still came off kind of pretty successfully. And then Tokyo, a pandemic Olympics where pretty much no one was there outside of you athletes and the officials. So, I mean, are you kind of uh, happy that you've experienced three levels of Olympics basically in the last decade when it comes to each of those cities? Yeah. Um, I mean, Tokyo, it's like you were so sad for the people of Tokyo because they would have put on such an epic games. Um, you know, bummed that like my family members couldn't have all been there because they would have just absolutely loved it. I mean, the whole city was just built for it, you know, like how efficient transit was. Um, anything that like, I mean, the first few days laundry in Tokyo was like this wild west, like everybody, people were losing things left, right and center. It was most inefficient, like crazy long lines. It took like one day and they were like, oh, this is inefficient. It's completely revamped. It's like the next day laundry is like a breeze. And you're just like, wow. that's just the way things were there. Everything yeah. was was incredible um so yeah that one i was just like i was so bummed that 
that they didn't really get to experience it fully, um, all the hard work, um, the volunteers and everything like that. And yeah, obviously family members to be able to travel to Tokyo to be able to get to see that really cool city. Um, yeah. Crazy to think just the effort and everything. Yeah. That goes that way. And it's, it's sort of that weird thing looking forward to what's potentially happening with the winters in like 2030 and 2034. Obviously, I'm a bit biased. I want Vancouver to have the 2030 Olympics or even Salt Lake to have them in 2030 or 2034. Yeah. But of course, Sapporo's up as well. And it would almost be a, a kind of a redemption for Japan to have an Olympics where hopefully by 2030 uh, fans can attend. And, uh, huh. you know, it can be a, a normal Olympics in, uh, in another few yeah. years' time. We hope it's over by then, right, Kim? Uh, let's hope so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be interesting how that plays out. But, I mean, before we get to Rio... Pan Am Games 2015 in Toronto, gold medal against the US, if you don't mind, uh, Canada's first gold medal in women's basketball. I mean, that experience obviously must be incredibly insane because any form, as you say, you can play basketball in your home country in front of a home crowd, let alone at a, at a Pan Am Games. I mean, what was that whole experience like? It was really cool. It was kind of um, what put Canada basketball on the map, you know, Um for, for the women's side, we, people, people got to see us. And obviously that Canada U S rivalry is like, it's a big thing. Um, I think lots of times, you know, we sort of feel like the, the younger sibling. And so people get up, you know, like all Canadians sort of get up and, and live with that rivalry. Uh, now granted this wasn't like the AUS team, but that didn't, most people don't know that, you know, and it didn't really matter. It matter. That They've still got the stars and stripes on the uniform. They're good. still America. Yeah, exactly. yes. <laughs> They're still incredibly talented. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, it was just really neat. Obviously, we had um, one of our young players, our Kia Nurse, just kind of went off in the final. Uh, and it was sort of just like – the way that she's been able to take that. She was the closing ceremony flag bearer, uh, which was really cool to see. Uh, and, you know, I mean, she's kind of been sort of like the face of Canada basketball and she's been able to manifest this into, you know, having some, some youth leagues. Uh, and I think it's just propelled our game forward uh, immensely uh, to be able to, to have that, to be able to play on home soil, um, to be able to have a great game um, it was a close game, you know, and then to come out on top of the gold medal, it was on TV. So it wasn't just like people in the pack stadium saw it. It was that people all over Canada saw it and, and kind of got behind us and, and rallied behind our team. It's really a name. The nurse surname has done a lot for Canadian basketball in the last uh, few years, hasn't it? Between Nick and Kia, like, I mean, come on, there's, there's something special about <laughs> nurse basketball in Canada, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, and hopefully it's not done now. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's insane to see that that correlation. Which, I mean, for a lot of say our Australian listeners and viewers, obviously who might not be overly familiar with the Pan Am Games, are of course sort of the the continental regional uh, version of say a Commonwealth or an Olympic Games for North and South America. And it's sort of I, I know through a lot of say Commonwealth Games for Australia because that's really the only one we sort of competing outside of the Olympics. There are moments that happen that almost transcend Olympic moments as well. You know, we, we remember certain gold medals from a Commonwealth Games more so than some of our Olympic medals or even Olympic moments. And it is sometimes, as you were saying, like interesting that that really puts it on the map for women's basketball because you need moments like that. You need a, a home games or something like that with national pride beating the arch enemy to really kind of kick it into gear. And did you kind of see that flow on effect post 2015 that sort of towards Rio and beyond that, you know, this was becoming something more of a, a bigger deal than it once was? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you saw the growth uh, almost immediately. Um, but now what's really, really cool is like seeing the young kids coming up in the program, uh, you know, and them being like, oh, yeah, like I watched, I watched that Pan Am Gamer, you know, I was there. Um, and just there is some crazy talent right now uh, on the young side in Canada. And it's really cool to see. And I think uh, I mean, the Pan Ams were a lot like that exposure that I had as a kid, you know, when you saw that, uh, to be in that environment as a young, as a young baller and to be like, whoa, like, I want to do this. I want to be this. Um, I think it's so huge. And so, yeah, it's fun to be able to look back at that and be like, I think that that changed the path for, for the women's game in this country. 
And what do you do with your medal? We always ask this with any medalist on the show. Is it sort of the, the Pan Am medal, something that kind of just goes in a drawer on display? Do your parents kind of have a shrine to you or something like that with all the, the medals and the awards that you've won over the years? You know, it's funny. I was actually thinking about that one the other day because I was like, oh, I don't even know where it is. <laughs> like, I, I mean, honestly, like the nature of my life right now is, you know, like play over in France, you know, for a bunch of the year. And then it's kind of like we have an apartment in Utah that we've had for a few years. I've got some stuff at my parents' house in BC. I've got some stuff at my sister's house in Toronto. So it's like, don't actually like have a, have a spot where you're like, this is where my things are. It's like my things are spread out all over the world. I spend most of my life out of a couple of suitcases. Uh, and so <laughs> I I should probably find it, but I have zero idea where to even look for it at the moment. So. <laughs> well, let us know when it's you do. Really not on display. We're, we're intrigued yeah. now for the, this medal, basically. It's like, it's like yeah. where's Waldo or something yeah. like that? Where's the medal, the medal uh, basically? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Rio, quarterfinals again, obviously a little bit closer this time against France. Um how was that experience obviously disappointing that one by the sounds of things that uh, a lot more you thought could have been achieved from Rio? Yeah. Yeah. Rio, we went in um, looking to medal. We had a really great mix on that team of kind of veterans and young players. Um, we had like this awesome lead up where we were playing really, really well at the start of the summer. And then yeah, to lose to France. Um, I think there was like six of us that played in the French that played over in France that season in their professional league. Um, so yeah, to lose to them too was, was tough. Cause it's sort of, they had kind of been a rival for the last few years. It's sort of a team that we had, we had faced a whole bunch. Um, so that's probably one of the worst losses of my career when I look back just being like man that was a game where you just wanted it to like restart it you know um mm. kind of started the game well and then just hit a slump and couldn't get ourselves out of it so yeah that was that was a tough one that was a tough one to recover from which I mean with any adversity any disappointment though you can use that i can imagine as fuel as, as as hard as it is obviously that you come out of that disappointed does that then though spur you on for the next olympic cycle obviously you assume it's only going to be four years but it turns out to be five but i mean does that then do you get on a practice court in the lead up to tokyo qualifying and you just got like a, a photo of the team of france going like oh angry like and just you know get out there and and, and try and play a little bit harder as real motivation towards your next olympics Man, yeah. Um, well, that's, you know, a lot of times after Olympics, a lot of people retire. And so the team kind of shifts um, and takes sort of a new form. And so that happened. Um, you know, there was kind of three really big retirements after after Rio. And so the team did sort of shift. Um, I mean, obviously, you still use that as motivation. Uh, but I think not in the sense of like, you look at that picture, it's sort of like, you know, I mean, some of the young players wouldn't even know. Um, and yeah, you kind of put it in the past and forget about it and move on. Um, but yeah, I mean, for, for some of the people that lived through it, maybe the next time you play France, it's like extra motivation, but hmm. it's kind of one of those where it's like, all right, we, we've got to change. We've got to do something different. And I think we're still searching for that formula. Um, obviously the pandemic <laughs> hit us hard. Just a bit. So. Yeah. It's it's yeah. been an interesting time with that. Which I mean that whole cycle though, obviously before Tokyo, before like that Olympic period, runner up in the FIBA America Cup. And I mentioned before Commonwealth Games. Basketball was at the twenty eighteen Commonwealth Games. Given it's so higgledy piggledy when they decide if basketball's gonna be at a games or not, how does that sort of come on board for somebody like yourself? Like do, do you look at that and go, Oh, well, I've never played in a Commonwealth Games before, that would be cool or depends on where you are because I, I don't know how that would be for an athlete in a sport which they never seem to make their mind up whether they wanted at the Commonwealth Games or not. Yeah, well, I think a lot of that goes down to our federation and I think a lot of times they sort of see Commonwealth Games as a good time to integrate younger players in a big games experience, um, you know, so that when they get to the senior level and they go to an Olympics, it's not like, whoa, this is wild, you know, it's sort of like they've had that that game's experience. Uh, and so I know that's what they did in, in the 2018 ones was, you know, kind of like 
integrate some of the young players and, and let them have a go at it, let them have a shot. Um, I mean, obviously, I think any big games is, is a ton of fun, obviously. You always want to yeah. play in them as a player. But but I think it's a great opportunity to, to yeah, let, let, let people experience it so that when they get to the senior level and they're playing in an Olympics, it's sort of like, okay, I've been there, I've done that. Um, it's a good stepping stone. Could you – you know, maybe tap on the shoulder and like, look, guys, like, you know, I get what you're doing here, but come on, I'd like to play. Like, I could help out. Like, you know, I've never done a Commonwealth Games. This would be fun to put on the bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I think, I want to say that they're during the pro season too. Um, yeah, well, they're not, the Commonwealth Games are generally, they, they're not like an Olympics where it's like, you know, it's going to be what, in a July. Like, I mean, when they're in yeah. Australia, they're in like March this year, what, they were just in July. So they never, again, yeah. they don't make their minds up. <laughs> yeah, because I remember it was in March and I remember it watching was. games. Yeah. But yeah, we were like mid, mid-pro mid season, you know, over in France. So it wasn't like, um, yeah, I don't think your professional team would be very pumped with having you like leave for a couple of weeks. <laughs> like, uh, yes. really? a Commonwealth, they wouldn't know what that yeah, is in France Com- for, for a national team, but yeah, they might not be very excited about that. Yeah. You know, Commonwealth games. I've never heard of that before. What, yeah. what's, uh, what's what is going that? on? That? Yeah. Never heard of that one before. Into Tokyo though, you're named captain for the team, uh, for your third Olympics. Again, uh, another massive honor. Could you have imagined that first time you said in grade nine that you sort of a uh, uh, witness to this and sort of lights a fire to go towards an Olympics and play for Canada that one day you'd be captaining your side at an Olympic games. Yeah, it's a pretty huge honor. Um, I mean, it's something that, you know, I, I had a lot of, great role models in my early years on the team uh, that I was able to learn from and kind of take the ropes from. And then, yeah, like over my basketball career and my experiences, you know, I've, I feel like I've played all roles, you know, I've, I've been the star, I've been the person that people have counted on, but I've also been the person on the bench, uh, you know, that didn't really get minutes. Um, And so, you know, as my career kind of evolved, I feel like I became a whole lot better as a leader and, kind of seeing what people needed, um, what would be good for the team. Uh, and obviously I've Canada basketball has always kind of come first in my life. Um, as far as, as you know, a lot of, a lot of decisions. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it's really cool to be rewarded for that. It's cool to, um, to be able to put to use what other people have taught me, um, and to hopefully have passed on some stuff to the next generation. How important is it as a captain to, obviously you want it all to come together on the court, but do you sort of go out of your way to let's all go bowling, let's all go on a camp, like, you know, sort of that team chemistry, camaraderie off court. I can imagine there's a a key importance as a captain to kind of make sure that that's off the court as well as off the court. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that was one of the craziest things about COVID is that it was like, these crazy rules, you know, or it's like, you're not allowed in each other's hotel rooms. Uh, you know, you're not allowed outside of the hotel. Um, you know, you always have to be masked unless you're at a meal and, you know, you have to be this far apart. And so it was just kind of like when I say, yeah, that, that things took a hit um, with our team, you know, and in Olympic qualifiers in 2020, we were, we were rolling, you know, we went three on three and oh, we beat, we beat a really good Belgium team on their home court in a packed gym. You know, we beat Japan. Um, and yeah, then it was kind of like things sort of fell off, fell off the wagon a little bit um, the following summer for us. And yeah, that's always one of those things that you look back on and you're like, man, um, this wasn't, you know, maybe we could have done some things differently and who knows results would have been different, but yeah. Um, that's that was maybe not my strongest leadership point. Um, well, it's it's interesting you say that because I mean it's, it's I can imagine with any sport momentum plays a key factor, and if you're having such a great season to then have it delayed by a year. I mean we've heard from so many people who kind of the, the year delay helped them. But, you know they might not have been able to perform mm-hmm. like they did if they didn't have that extra year. But it's always interesting to hear on sort of the flip side about how that could have been had it just gone ahead in in 2020. Because yeah, they sound having a great season and then all of a sudden boom you've got to put it on ice for 12 months yeah so we obviously um we had we had two um two two major players that were kind of coming back from injury and not maybe at 100 percent yet and then obviously i was 
only a couple of months postpartum. Um, and so I was not the same player whatsoever. And so, yeah, I think for our team, the delay did not, yeah, we just, it didn't really help us at all. Um, but you know, I mean, that's, it is what it is. Uh, Cause did that yeah. with the media attention that you got sort of in the lead up in terms of, you know, the breastfeeding issue and that sort of stuff, is that a big distraction for your preparation? I mean, I can imagine it's not helping you uh, sort of with this kind of issue. You've got to worry about your new baby at the same time as trying to captain the team at the Olympics. I mean, I can't imagine that's the best lead in for any Olympic athlete. Yeah. Um, I mean, already trying to be postpartum and come back on a quick timeline was really difficult. Uh, and it was just kind of hard not knowing, um, you know, because nobody, I could never get a straight answer on if they would be allowed to come and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, um, that was a tough lead up. It was tough to, to kind of always be divided and like that, um, yeah, sort of feel like, is this going to happen? Um, you know, also just in my head, I was like, I don't know if I could do this without her being there. Like it was just these wild decisions as a, as a mother and as an athlete where like your two worlds just, just couldn't line up. Um, yeah. And just kind of daily battles, emotional battles with, with that. How did it get sorted? Did they did they cave? Were you allowed to take her with you, or did it kind of just you had to come up with another solution before the Olympics? No, yeah, um, that was a little bit like the power of social media. Uh, you know, it was kind of like we kept trying to get our story to the right people, and I wasn't the only athlete um, that mm. was that was in this situation. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, uh, the story got to the right people. It was heard by the right people. Uh, and they were able to come. So right. I was able to continue. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things with basketball is that it's not like you just go to Tokyo for, you know, a couple of days and it's over. It's like we were gone for, for a month. Um, so that was a long time. Uh, and so, yeah, they were able to come, which was really, really cool. Uh, pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, obviously the basketball results was not what we were looking for. Uh, so that was pretty tough. Well, I want to ask about that because from an Australian perspective, we were very happy with how that all played out basically because it was what the new format where you had to have the best third place teams to get into the quarterfinals. And Australia obviously had to get 25 points more against Puerto Rico. They did it, got through, but that was at the expense of Canada. And I remember being on air because we're co-Canadian, co-Australian, so our Canadian co-host, not too happy that that was happening. Were, were you watching this game and just going like, come on, Puerto Rico, drop a three, drop this, drop that, because we're all cheering, more points, more points, and you're going, no, 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 less points, less points. Like, how was that? It was awful. So it actually, after we lost to Spain, uh, we kind of had, there was like, Five different situations where if it happened, we would have advanced uh, in all of these games. And so it was sort of like when you started watching some of these games and by the end, it was kind of just like, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't even watch that last game because it was just sort of like your heart was broken every single time you watched one of these games and like the situation just didn't turn in your favor. You know, it was like the France U S like the U S I had to be, you know, if they beat France by 11 points or more, you know, it was like all these like point spread differential things that were like this close to going our way and then just didn't. And so it was almost like just tearing off a bandaid like six times after you, you know, like lost. Um, so it was so much worse than just being like, okay, we lost and we're out. It was like, how could we make this more painful? So yeah, by the time that Australia, that was the last one and I wasn't even watching anymore. I was just like, I can't, my heart wow. does not have enough to handle this anymore. Well, I guess so, as yeah. an Australian, I apologize for that. Um, That's I mean, all right. Hey, involved, it was but... on us. We would yeah. have taken care of business. We would have been fine, but <laughs> we had it in our hands and we didn't, we didn't get the job done. So yeah, that's what happens, but. Because when it's out of your control too, like, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? As you said, like if you were just, you had an elimination game that you left it all out in the court and you didn't quite do it when you're literally sitting there having to get a calculator out and work things out, basically, that's, yeah. uh, 
not what you want as as an athlete. But I mean, it's also like the format. I mean, changing it sort of into this extra group with the third place elimination. I mean, what just happened to the good old two groups, top four in? Like that's just classic, simple, easy. Bring that back for Paris, right? It is, yeah. And it's wild that they still like made it the full two weeks, you know, because basketball Mm. is one of the only. So it's not just one week or like the first mm-hmm. week or the second week. Like almost every sport only goes that and basketball. They still like dragged it out over the full two weeks, but you just, you didn't really have that many games, you know? I mean, you go yeah. from playing in like world cups where it's like 10 games in 14 days, you know, and you go to the Olympics and it's like three games over two weeks and you're kind of like, Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just a different way, which I mean, moving forward now, uh, time of recording this, we've got a world cup coming up in australia of course uh very excited for uh are, are you are you on the team are you coming to australia are you, are you going to be playing that uh or i mean what's what's now for for you because sort of moving forward yeah we'll not be in australia um cannot wait to cheer that group on that's going to be there um i think australia is going to put on a heck of a show i'm really excited also like lauren jackson coming out of retirement oh, just insane is the coolest thing ever i right? am just like <laughs> I'm like Team Lauren Jackson, you know, it's like you grew up and she was one of like the greatest players to ever play this game. And so for her, I'm just like, I'm just like fangirling, like just in awe, you know, like having her come back. I think it's just the greatest thing ever. Um, yep. I can't wait to watch it. I can't wait to watch her. Um, I hope she just like dominates and yeah, you guys win I'm pretty gold. sure she will. She, she, I mean, it's just in her nature, right? That's just what it's she does. It's in her nature. Like, yeah. You're right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm pretty pumped for that. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's next. Um, obviously, I've personally, like, retired after London and Rio. I said that I was going to retire. So, now I'm, like, I'm just done saying I'm going to retire, you know. Like, <laughs> You've retired from retiring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'm not sure what's next. Um, we will see. So what you're saying is Paris is a possibility, given that you played so much in France that, uh, you know, this could almost be the closest home Olympics you might ever get, given it doesn't look like Canada is sadly going to be having a yeah. summer Olympics anytime yeah, soon. Yeah, there, um, <laughs> there is a part of me that feels like France is like a second home for sure. Yeah. Well, exciting. Well, keep an eye. Never say never, Kim. I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's, it's right. a possibility going on that way. Uh, we're going to close out. Uh, with a bunch of uh, fun sort of get to know yourself questions, which I'm pretty sure you probably would have answered these because these were given to Team Canada athletes before Rio and Pyeongchang. And unfortunately, if you did one, yours wasn't published on the Team Canada website, but it was sort of a get to know you style questionnaire. There was drawing involved. Do you remember doing something like this? No. No. Oh, okay. Maybe you didn't. Well, here we go. Maybe the late sort of, uh, you know, qualification. They didn't have time to get you these pieces of paper or something for Rio. But uh, the drawing, I'll say, it's not compulsory. But if you're bored, you want to do some homework, uh, there's a couple of drawings you can send in to us and we can put on our social media. So there's a draw a picture of yourself, draw a picture of a Canadian animal. What would the Mm -hmm. coolest Olympic medal look like? So, again, Mm -hmm. Kim, you're just chilling. You want to put some stuff on paper? We won't say no. We play sometimes like that, like Pictionary game where you have to like draw something and then you pass mm-hmm. it and the person ahead of you has to guess it. Yep. And I was actually always like teamed with Kia um, because uh, her and I are some of the worst drawers <laughs> on the team. Um, and we had like some of our guesses were just like absolutely atrocious based on the drawing. So I, um, yeah, I don't even think you'd be able to like guess that it was a person. <laughs> That's what I tried to draw uh, based on, based on our game. Well, I love that sometimes when I see these questionnaires and it comes to the draw a picture of a Canadian animal, people will put a polar bear in a snowstorm and just leave it white. So, um, yeah, you know, there you go. there's <laughs> your option, potentially do that. Uh, but I'll start off with what is your favorite Olympic moment? Ooh, um, like personally, mine was just running out to my very first game. Beautiful. Great answer. I like it when people answer their own. It makes it a little bit more special. Uh, The best candy in the world is? Candy. Uh, I'm definitely a chocolate person. Uh, Mm -hmm. Not really a candy person, but it's the Milka Choco Biscuit Bars. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. I always, I love it when I hear these and I just, I always regret asking food questions because I do these interviews at the worst times when I shouldn't eat and I'm like, 
shit, now I'm hungry. So oh, now I know. need that 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got to do it. And, and it leads into my next question. Another food question. Of course it is, Ben. Uh, my favorite sandwich is. Favorite sandwich. Huh. Mm. Man. Um, I'm going to go with uh, just like a turkey grinder. Uh, there's nice. a spot in Connecticut where my husband is from. It's called mm -hmm. Mama's Pizza, and they make very, very good grinders. So okay, shout out to yeah. Mama's Pizza in Connecticut. There you go. Okay. Get along. Get on board. Sounds great. <laughs> uh, what do you most like to do in your spare time? So since I became a mom, that's like not a lot. Um, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> prior to that? Yeah, prior to that, it would probably be uh, reading, and I like to cook. Well, I really like to like look up recipes, but not always make them, but I'm really a big fan of just checking out the recipes and seeing what I could be eating. <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny you say that, Kim. That's my excuse for, uh, you know, not being an Olympian. I like to watch the Olympics and see what I could yeah. do. And maybe one day uh -huh. I might make the Olympics. You know, I'm yeah. getting older. But so it's, it's work. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly, right? That's exactly it. Yeah. Uh, your favourite sports movie is? Ooh, favourite sports movie um, like I grew up with love and basketball. Mm -hmm. That's so a good one. one. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's, I mean, there's a beauty of basketball. Is there's so many basketball movies, right? Like sometimes we get an athlete on from luge and it's like, well, what, what's a luge movie? But like, yeah, yeah I mean, but I mean, the, I'm using the questionnaire that was given here to uh, Heather Bainsley, a beach volleyball player and her favorite sports movie <laughs> is space jam. So, I mean, come on, classic, right? Yeah, so that is a classic. Yeah. Exactly. Not space jam two space jam one. Let's, let's clarify <laughs> that. Um, as a kid, your favorite sports team was, uh, I mean, as a kid, it was the Canucks, <laughs> the Vancouver Canucks. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, did you just grow out of that? 2011, 2011, you just go, nah, not anymore. Or... <laughs> Ooh, man, yeah. You know, my husband is a big Bruins fan too. So Ooh. that was a rough year for us. Yeah. Ouch. Jeez. I know. Yeah. yeah. My, my ex yeah. was a Canucks fan when I lived in Victoria and um, okay, yeah. I used to like to give her that a lot. It was, you know, yeah. but uh, as a Flames fan, we just don't mention 2004, <laughs> so it's all right. Um, your favorite workout is? Sorry, what was that? Your favorite workout. Oh, I love cardio. Ah, like, um, nice. Yeah, cardio to like the point where you want to throw up. Like that's <laughs> like always been my jam and I don't know why, um, but... <laughs> I've always like loathed lifting, but a good a good cardio session on an elliptical is um, great. Always with yeah. a vomit bag ready to go. Basically, you're saying like yeah. yeah well, no, there. I don't actually like throw up from working out, but <laughs> yeah, just for like you finish and you're like your face is like a tomato and you're just like whoa. Yeah, yeah. That's a good work in. Yeah. Love I it. like that. I like that. We, it's, it's always, I love that discrepancy because sometimes we get people like, oh yeah, I hate, hate cardio. It's all about the lifting. And then it's like, no, cardio, yeah. screw the lifting. So yeah, yeah, good, good old battles out there. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Ooh, BC. BC. I absolutely Home. love BC. Yeah. Good answer. Oh. It's, um, yeah. I, I will say like, I sort of lived there pandemic time so you know couldn't get to the mainland a lot as much as i'd like yeah. but i still stand by the fact that vancouver is literally the cleanest city i've ever been to in the world uh <laughs> no matter every time i go to vancouver it's ridiculously clean how is that yeah. possible <laughs> not if i'm visiting the right areas but yeah it's, it's insane that it's that clean yeah. um if you could have lunch with any one person who would it be mm. any one person um, this is a really tough one. Uh, I'm going to go with Magic Johnson. Good answer. Nice. Yeah. I like that. Did yeah. you watch the, the, the show, the Lakers, uh, what was it? The one they had earlier this year with Magic Johnson involved. Was it an HBO show? I think they had, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Was it, I actually haven't seen it yet. So was it enjoyable? Worth the, worth the watch? Yeah, but I really like them, so I might be totally biased. No, that's fine. That's completely okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're allowed to be that way. Yes. Salt. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to like it no matter what, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you'll love it. Yeah. I have to admit, when I watched The Last Dance, 
big MJ fan, so it was kind of always like you're going to love yeah. it no matter what. And it turned out to be brilliant anyway, so it's sort mm-hmm. of that way. If you could choose yeah. any Olympic host city, where would it be? Any Olympic host city? Like mm. to play in or? You are, you are Thomas Bach. You have carte blanche of anywhere in the world. The winner is uh, the 2036 Summer Olympics are going to. You can choose anywhere. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously I would like choose Vancouver because that's home. Um, but maybe like second place in Switzerland, because that might be one of the most picturesque and cool countries uh, yeah. that I've ever been to and I really like it there. So it's, 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 I, yeah, I think that would be a great place to have it. And it's, um, you know, technically the home of the Olympics, right? With Lucerne. So, I mean, it's sort of, yes. you know, it, it fits yeah. in very well there and Vancouver. Yeah perfectly host of a summer Olympics could be next to Beijing of having a summer and a winter Olympics. So, you know, exactly. the, yeah. everything's there for Vancouver Thank to have you. a summer game. Yeah. So bring yeah. it on Thomas. He's a big listener to the show, Thomas. I'm sure he'll uh, take that on board. Sure, uh, <laughs> loves the show. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Ooh, um, to, is it, wait, I'm going to get confused. The one where we can like just travel like in a blink of an eye. Is like teleportation, teleport? kind of, yeah, yeah. like click fingers. Never have things. to take long flights again. Yeah, yep. just be able yep. to, boom, I'm at the next spot. I have dinner in to... Switzerland and, you know, lunch exactly. in, in Connecticut, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah. Simple, yeah, easy. Yeah, that, please. Love that answer. Always works. What is the weirdest instruction a coach ever gave you? You've... <sighs> You get some doozies sometimes playing overseas <laughs> in broken English, um, for sure. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of them aren't really appropriate. Uh, <laughs> you know. Go on, yeah. everything's appropriate on this show, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. I've man, some of my overseas coaches it's just been like, um, <laughs> what did he say? He was just like, quit. Uh, yeah, it'll be like quit. He said like quit the butt, um, <laughs> shoot the shoot the balls, and yeah, no, it's and wow. He told me, yeah, I've been told to like go f myself. Um, that was probably the worst advice in the middle of a game. To I could to imagine stream. that's not that motivating. Uh. Just, you know, like, <laughs> but I mean, a lot of it is just because it's like those are the only English words that he knew. So it was just like, let me just. He's probably thinking like I'm giving you this big motivational speech, like, oh, yes, all right, Kim, go fuck yourself. You're like, what? Like, yeah. excuse yeah. me? <laughs> I saw this in a movie one time. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, get a lot of that. Yeah. Wow. The curse words. Get a lot of the curse words is just like the, the ultimate. The ultimate guess, advice. Yes. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, sure. Uh-huh. I think we can make a book, some of these, these advice things that we're learning on the show. Last one here. I love this one, Kim, because it's so open-ended and you can interpret this however you want. When you were little, what was one thing you always thought? Uh, that I was going to grow up and be a whale trainer. A, a whale trainer. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. Okay. Did you ever and pursue then- that? <laughs> no. You know, basketball took over. And then the documentary Black out and I remember my my sister emailed me and she was like thank goodness you became a basketball player because you were always like really dedicated as a kid and like that was like my ultimate passion like every single book report that I did as a child was like on killer whales and I would like go to the aquarium all the time and I was like this is gonna be me you know and so yep. she was like well thank goodness basketball panned out because this <laughs> turns out to be a terrible profession yes indeed wow Gee, I, I just thought it was free really that inspirational maybe for you uh kind of as that was one of my one of my favorite movies growing up for sure yeah, exactly wow that's insane <laughs> well I mean now that you've sort of retired from retiring you don't know what's next I mean you, you know lots have changed since that documentary yeah. so I'm sure it's a lot yeah. better now so mm-hmm. never yeah. say never don't know how many whales there are there in our Salt Lake City at the moment but uh you know yeah, I don't, BC. I don't a lot here but we're <laughs> we're moving out of here so we're good yes BC, back home. There you go. That's exactly yeah. where you need to be. Kim, yeah. uh, before we let you go, people want to follow your journey, keep up to date with whatever is happening next in your life, social media, websites, anything along those lines that people can follow you? Uh, yeah, pretty spotty poster on Instagram at K-Gauchet, G-A-U-C-H-E-R. 
Beautiful. Done. I'm, I'm actually really proud of myself. I just want to say this plug to myself that I got your name correct at the beginning of this interview. So uh, yeah. research does play off, kids. There you, there go. you go. Yeah. <laughs> this, you know, terrible Australian accent when it comes to pronouncing words, uh, you know, I, I made sure I got it correct. So, you nailed uh, the you, French one, though. Yeah. You, you're welcome. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. It Kim, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today to learn about your career and uh, all the highlights and everything else in between. Uh, best of luck with everything. And we'll get you on after Paris 2024 when Canada brings home the gold in women's basketball. How That's does that right. sound? That's right. That sounds awesome.